Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted with Susan Smith. Hello and welcome. I'm Susan Smith. You are in my studio, Stitched by Susan. I call this Quilting's first reality show because in these episodes, we are live streaming the quilting of an actual project. Frequently, there are thread breaks and catastrophes in camera fallovers and various oopses, and we let it all stand because I can so remember what it was like to be a beginning quilter and have all these questions and wonder how the thing worked and if I was doing it right. So hopefully welcoming you into my studio to watch over my shoulder as I stitch will kind of set your mind at rest and help you work through some of those dilemmas. So live and unscripted, that's what we're doing today. Today's project is a small table topper and I'm going to be quilting a variation of my uh, spineless all over feather. So I do have a free class for that. If you haven't seen it yet, I forgot to give Mr. Producer a link to put in the show note in the actual chat feed, but we'll put it in the show notes. Um, you can find it on my website too. So I have a free class for this spineless all over feather. The beauty of it is you can move all over the quilt and there's no need to backtrack or trace back over the spine of the feather. So what I'm quilting today is a variation on it. It's a different look, but the same similar thread path. And I'll talk much more about that as we get to the quilting. So because it is a small project, I am going to show everything from the very beginning, from the very loading process, right through to the end. So many of you know, if you've been following recently, I have a fairly new to me long arm and it's a Bernina Q24. And the loading has been a bit of a, an experimental thing because I do quite a high number of quilts. And so I'm after efficiency when I'm loading. So I began by taking Bernina's recommended way to load a quilt back. And then I took it from there and put my own spin on it. Um, so I'll show you a bit of those details today. We've actually got a camera kind of from the end of the long arm so that you can see all my rails and see how that works. So before we get started quilting, a few more places that you can find me clearly on my website, stitchedbysusan.com. There, there's a gallery of quilts that I've done if you love looking at pictures and there's tabs for classes that I offer and in particular, my freehand quilting masterclass, which is um, a huge comprehensive online course. It's pre-recorded. You can watch at your leisure. There's over 30 designs similar to the one we're doing today in that they're all over a quilt top. Um, so lots more details on that if you're interested in it. And the next um, class doors will be opening about the end of April. More details on that in the newsletter. And if you want to sign up for my newsletter, you can also do that at my website. You'll get a little pop-up inviting you um, I'm offering you a freebie, and when you opt into that, then you will also be on my newsletter and you'll get notifications for um, the Freehand Quilting Masterclass as it comes available, and I've got some free workshops and things leading up to that as well that you may be interested in. Also, I have a podcast, and it is called Measure Twice, Cut Once, and Other Life Lessons Learned from Quilters. Um, sometimes it's just me talking, but more often it is me chatting with some other crafter. So it could be my sister-in-law who's a soap maker. Sometimes it's been a weaver, but very frequently it is quilters and people in the quilting industry. So just chatting about their story, what quilting has meant in their lives, and if quilting has become a business for them. So very casual, easy listening. You can find all of those at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. If you are interested in supporting this show, YouTube, as you know, is a free resource, but it does cost, of course, to produce these shows. So you can support us at buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan for as little as $5 one time, or if you choose, you can commit monthly and all of those dollars go toward up leveling our equipment. So hopefully you can see in the view today, we've got some new overhead lights going on and we've also got some floor based ones. Uh, shining at me. So there should be a lot more light today in the view. So let us know if you see that improvement, if it's a good choice. And we're always trying to, you know, better our video quality as we learn more about producing them. So buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And thank you so much to those who have supported. And a brief little aside here, Jeremy Dickerson, who chimed in in my introduction at the beginning and said hello, has been communicating with us because he too has a YouTube show. And so we're just kind of swapping notes about camera equipment and filming and streaming and all those things. So I'm glad that Jeremy um, 
gave a chance, had a chance to come in live and sort of see what's going on. Mr. Producer is telling me something and I missed it. Oh, there you go. Mr. Producer is going to put his link in the comments. While we're talking about him, let's give a few credits here before we go on. The introduction was my son, Will. That's his voice introducing the show. Uh, Mr. Producer is my husband, Dave, who's behind the scenes. Here's a look at him with all his, well, you can't even see all the wires and things. I'll have to show you the other side of his desk because it's a bit of a warren, let me tell you. Anyway, he makes this all happen. And I very much appreciate it. Could not do this by myself. And then finally, but very importantly, our good friend, Dan Unger, who provides the lovely guitar music that you hear in the background of all these live and unscripted episodes. His album's not available for sale, but he graciously allows us to air it. So you have to come here to hear that music. Have I missed anything, Mr. Producer? Are we ready to dive in? I think we're ready to go. One more sip of elixir and we'll get going. Okay, I'm going to start loading up the backing. And apparently there was a question about whether my sister-in-law sells her soap or not. So far, no. She just makes it available to family members. So it's a good thing to be related to her. But I'll let you know if that changes because she makes wonderful soaps. But let me grab the backing and let's start loading. Okay, just off camera for a jiffy. Okay, I think we should have our end of... Um, end of machine view here for a moment. And I'll go ahead and talk about this just a little bit. I get so many questions from you guys about how my quilt is loaded. And it's hard to know whether to tell it to you before I load or after, but I'll give you this shot before. This bar here is meant to be the backing end. So I'm meant to be rolling up my backing onto this rail. And then as I quilt and finish things, finish the quilt, taking it up on this take up roller, right? So my backing would extend across under the dead bar and onto the take up roller. Well, I like to um, affix or secure my quilt top, which is going to float. Some of these terms you'll see in a little bit later. It floats and, and, and uh, hangs down right in front of me. So I put magnets on this rail to hold it still. For that reason, I don't want to have my backing rolled up on here with multiple rolls. When you get a large quilt and multiple layers of fabric, those magnets won't stick. So I actually have my backing leader on this bottom rail and it just comes around this top one. So it's oriented in the same way. It pulls off in the same way, but there's just the one layer then passing over this bar. I hope that all makes sense and you'll see it a little more as I load up as well. And then one last thing that I do to prep, actually, let me tell you about this week's improvement. Can you see here that I put my um, long armors tape measure, I stuck it onto my um, dead bar and I just used 3M double-sided tape to stick that on there. I don't center my quilts. You'll see that as we go along, but this is a great reference point for as you are advancing your quilt, you can know edge of my quilt is at 34 and you can keep that quilt edge perfectly straight just a great guideline so I just stuck it on there permanently okay this is how I prep to load a quilt this is my leader it is under my dead bar or leveler bar some brands call it and I pull some excess and flip it right over and this seems kind of unwieldy but watch as the process goes on and you'll see how slick it works and I thought, I'm not going to be able to describe that in words, so I'm going to just show you. And then I put enough of it over that I can see it underneath here, which you'll see me using too as I load the quilt. So I'm just going to walk back and forth along now, and I think we could do the overhead camera again. Um, I'm just walking along and tugging it so that I'm sure it is pulled tight. I don't want any, you can see this awkwardness, the ripples in here. I don't want any of that. So I'm just tugging it so that I'm sure it's smooth and even, and then we're ready to load. Okay, so now on with the process. And I show this process to you often, but I thought that pre-setup might be beneficial to you today. So I've got my front leader um, over this bar, and I've got just a little clamp the typical clamps that I use for securing the side of my quilt, 
I've got one at each side just to hold that leader in place so it doesn't, you know, slide down. And I'm using my red snapper system to load. I'm just going to move Stella out of the way a little bit. If you haven't met my long arm, let me introduce you. This is Stella, um, Q24 Bernina. I do have the robotic system, the computerized system. I do not have it turned on at this moment. I'm struggling. This is such a little quilt and I've got it draped over the edge and it keeps pulling. Um, this has been a week of learning. I had my robotics up and running this week and did a few quilts that way because I want to be um, reasonably knowledgeable about that and how to use it. So I was in school this week, let me tell you. I was at a quilt show with Bernina last weekend in Puyallup, Washington. And um, my colleague who was in the long arm Bernina booth with me has done a lot of the robotics work. So he was gracious enough to give me a whole bunch of mini lessons while we were there. It was four days. And so we had various things that were quilting out for um, viewers to see. And so he let me practice and he taught me a whole lot of things kind of on the fly. It was great. Okay. So I've attached my backing right here. This is a selvage edge. So it's nice and straight. I know that it's straight. You notice that I didn't center anything. It doesn't really matter. I just got it straight on this edge and then over the rail. And this is important that I have my backing straight because having not centered it, how am I going to keep that quilt straight is I need to know that it's pulling on exactly straight and not veering left or right. And I can usually tell that you see, if I pull it just a little bit, we start getting these diagonal creases. You don't want that. So then you tug it back until it lays flat. And now as I begin to roll it, the resistance of the fabric coming over the leader here is going to keep it taut and straight and smooth. And it's going to pull on evenly. One side will not be faster or slower than the other. It works like magic. I'm telling you. And it's fast. I'm about two things, high quality and efficiency. This combines them both. So now I'm rolling that backing. And remember I said I was leaving the other leader. I'll come over so you can see me. I was leaving this leader far enough down that I could see the edge of it, which you can't really see on camera right there. So as I'm rolling up my quilt, I've got to be able to see when the edge of my backing is approaching the edge of that leader. And now that it is, I walk around to the other side and fasten that other end. And you'll more likely get a nice, nice view of the back of my head when I do this. And one tiny tip, sometimes when I roll this ahead, depending on the weight of the backing, it wants to pull off. So I keep one of my small magnets nearby and I just clap it on the one end to hold it in place. Right there, I could see it going. It was pulling away from me. So I've just tugged it back so I can see that it's nice and straight and even again. And now I will attach my leader on this end. It's a mini aerobic workout, let me tell you, putting these leaders on. Makes me puff just a little bit. I'll try not to do it into the mic. There it is, backing all attached. There is a shorter way around my long arm in case you wonder why I always walk the long way around. Um, but there's a lot of cables there, so I can't walk that way. So now I will keep unscrolling that far bar and it just flops into place because I threaded it through, so to speak, the proper way under my dead bar. Now it just starts rolling up the way that I want it to. And just like that, we have a backing loaded. Perfect. I'm 100% pleased. All right, on to the batting. I am using Hobbs 80-20 batting, my all-time favorite. 80% is cotton, 20 is poly. So you have the tiny bit of shrinkage, kind of traditional shrinkage from the cotton, and you have a little bit more loft from the poly certainly some durability and Hobbs 8020 is an extremely economical 
all-purpose, washable, lovely batting. Oh, there's my note to myself. Let's take that off. And here's our little quilt. And I didn't really talk about the backing specifically, but as you can see, the top of the quilt is this gold and white, and the backing has this lovely blue, couple shades of blue and navy in it too. I think it's a great choice. It's just that little bit of a surprise, little bit of party in the back. So I'm just visually lining up the top of my quilt with my red snapper, because I know that's a straight line, right? And I'm gonna base the whole thing, but that way I don't have to use a ruler. I don't necessarily have to pin it in place. Certainly if you're more comfortable pinning it first, you can. I tend to wing it. I was just, I keep a small journal that I jot down every quilt that I do and who it was for and its sizes. And I'm just about to 1200 this week. And so at that point, I'm pretty comfortable lining up the top of the quilt. And I pushed start instead of just pulling up a bobbin thread, which is why I'm struggling here to pull up now two or three stitches. <laughs> I really am struggling, but there's my thread right there. Let's go ahead and use a basting stitch for fun. I was actually very early this morning, I was up quilting um, a pre-printed panel. So it had a straight line kind of outlining uh, the design on the panel. So just to experiment, I did not have my stitch regulator on Stella, or not my stitch regulator, I'm sorry, my channel lock. So just to experiment, I thought, how perfectly straight of a line will she stitch? It feels like she's stitching really straight if I just nudge her forward and back. And she did. So I was happy to know that. That comes under the heading of, you know, know your machine. Because I now know that on my left and right side for basting, I don't have to pin that or put the channel lock on. Stella stitches a beautifully straight line. If I just gently push her and don't um, micromanage her, she stitches a really great line. On the top, I do have the channel lock on now. I can't do this one as accurately by guess and by gosh. Although certainly I do have the guideline of the red snapper. Certainly I could if I wished put a ruler on there too. So there's various ways to get it straight, but I do like to know that my quilt has straight basting, 90 degree corners. All that makes me happy. What this basting does even on a small project, is it controls the shape of your finished project. I have recently, I was in a, um, a quilting shop that has multiple long arms for rent. So various people quilt on them. And I was kind of surprised at how many people did not baste. They just started quilting. To me, that's kind of a non-negotiable. It guaranteed when you quilt in the center of it, it's going to pull up that top fabric and you're going to distort the shape of it might only be a little bit, but multiplied across a large quilt might actually be quite a lot. So to me, it's an easy um, preventive way of not having any of that stretching or distortion happening. And I love to end up with a perfectly square quilt when I'm done. My side clamps, because so many of you ask, are also by Red Snapper. And I do love them. They're so long, as you can see, they fill up most of my throat space and I love that. They grasp my quilt backing. I've already got my quilt basted. So just by having them on the backing only, they're still putting even tension across the whole thing, right? Cause it's all attached now by this basting line. So I don't stretch it super tight. I just put enough tension on that I know that it will stay flat and smooth. Just a gentle tension. And it may look taut to you on the screen, but for me, like I can still grab my fingers when I push them up from below. So it's just tight enough to keep everything in place. Let's do one last thing to secure because we've secured our left, our top and our right, right? Now we need to secure the front edge. That's what the magnets are for. 
This is why I don't like to have my backing rolled up on this bar, thick and multiple layers. When I have the single layer, these magnets will always stick. And now I've got a work surface that will not shift. It's secured on all four sides. I can quilt to my heart's content and it's not moving anywhere. So before we start quilting, I'm gonna grab another sip of coffee and let's have a few questions. Let me get my cup in hand, stand back from the quilt. Okay. Why don't you center, Susan? I've always heard you had to. Please explain when you have time. Well, Jan, the reason for centering is so that you get, the ultimate reason is so that you get a square quilt. But the smaller reason is so that you know you're loading it straight, right? If you center this end of the backing and you center that end of the backing, you know it is straight. But one of the things that requires then is that your backing be trimmed and be fully square. I quilt for a lot of clients and not even half of the backings come to me actually square, right? So I would have the time of squaring them up or I can load in this method, which means if I have a straight front edge and I pay attention that my fabric is pretty true to the straight of grain and as you saw, I'm watching and I'm using my knowledge of fabric to know that it's running straight and I pull it on straight and I end up with a square quilt. And again, I've done this dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times and I end up with a square quilt. So it's about preserving the quality, but saving a ton of time. Betsy, what would that lower bar be normally used for? It would be for the top of the quilt. Let me set my coffee down and I'll show you. I mentioned floating a top earlier. This is floating a top. The end of this top is just hanging down in front of me. Even if it was a big quilt, it would be hanging down in front of me and I'd just be zhuzhing the extra under my machine. But if you were not a floater of tops, <laughs> you would have your backing rolled up here and your top would come over and be rolled onto this bottom roller. And that does not prevent it from coming all the way up when you're ready to quilt it. There's a long leader and extender on here as well. So it would just roll up and you would quilt it. Lots of people quilt that way. Lots of people like to have their top snug and rolled out smooth too, because that, that gives them assurance that it's going to be flat and square. You try what works best for you. I've had really good success with floating tops. It's a really good time saver. Mr. Producer is warning me there's a lot of questions. Shorten up my answers. So we'll try and catch them all. Um, we'll try. Kathy, interesting you attach to the front first. I attach to the back beam first. That's just my personal choice, Kathy. I love having that straight edge at the front and starting from there. If you've found another procedure that works for you, go at it. WC, where do you purchase the magnets? Local hardware store. Um, also, I think I've got them on my resource page um, on my website, and they're also at the end of the show notes. Um, we always add the show notes after the live event. So if you look at any past YouTube episodes, you'll see show notes with links to a ton of my favorite tools. Robin, how often did you, do you change the needle on your gamel? Um, sort of when it was giving me trouble. You know, their recommendation is going to be one with every quilt, but it depends on the brand of needle. You know, a titanium needle will last longer. So whenever I started hearing it tap, 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 tapping, or if I saw any difficulties with thread shredding, my first cue was to change a needle. You certainly could change it after every big quilt or after, say, eight hours of quilting. It's a good guideline. Carol, do you feel any need to use the end clamps? And by end clamps, do you mean what's on the left and right side of my quilts? And I do have those on. And yes, I do, I do usually use them. Same question, Dave. <laughs> I didn't mention too, if you guys would type the letter Q in front of your question, it means that Mr. Producer can search for questions among all the comments and pull them up. I'm sorry I forgot to say that sooner. You don't have to go back and redo it, but going forward, if you just put the letter Q in front, he can search for all the Qs. And I miss Jan's, I'm so sorry I'm talking. Where is that share button? Lower right hand corner. Like and subscribe. Share with your friends. Um, yeah, if you subscribe and also if you click on the bell, you'll be notified whenever I'm going live for one of these episodes. 
Lauren, with your new machine, do you not need to use the yardsticks? I sometimes do, Lauren. It depends on how much clearance there is, whether or not my machine is bumping into my clamping apparatus at the sides. When it does, I do still use the yardsticks. They're right here, ready. Pam, even though I do baste, I still get a frown at the bottom of large quilts. How do I overcome this? Pam, it's, it's, it's preventive, and in larger quilts, you'll hear me talk about it. Every time I advance a pass, I'm gauging whether my seam allowances are running straight and true and making adjustments. If the quilt's not square, you might need to make adjustments as you're basting, but the key is to do it in increments with each pass so you don't get that big old frown when you get to the bottom. And I was taught to iron and starch my backing. It seems watching you that that is not necessary. You said it. I mean, perhaps it ups the level of the quilt, but I think any client I've ever quilt for agrees that my quilts are flat and square. They don't have wrinkles. They don't have pleats. It works and it's quick. Mickey, did you remove the canvas leader from the backing bar? Yes, I did. There is, uh, yes, I did. There's no, I had to look. There's no leader on it right now. Barbara, how's the red thread cup attached so it stays in place? A little piece of two-sided sticky tape. Low tech, that one. Okay, let's get started quilting, folks. You can start in the top corner, left side or right side, does not matter. I'm gonna start right side just for cuz. You'll see as I go that I alternate for each pass which side I'm starting on, so it truly doesn't matter. And to Lauren who asked about the yardsticks, I am gonna put them in this time. My clamps are sagging a little bit on the side and I do not want my sew head, my arm, to run into my side clamps. So adding this little yardstick, you can see it on that side, just raises up my clamps a little bit. All right. So I mentioned earlier, um, my all over freehand feather is kind of the basis for this design. Many of you have taken that free class. If you haven't, um, what's the best way to get to it, Dave? We'll think about that and I'll probably put a, probably put a quick link in the comments. Yep. Um, it's on Thinkific. Dave's going to find a link for you guys. But if you have watched it at all, you'll know that it's all about um, having a spineless feather so that you can add the plumes of the feather without ever having to backtrack or trace the spine. So, you know, by spineless, of course, I don't mean can't make up its own mind. I just mean it doesn't have the stitched, the stitched line. So... I can't quilt this and talk at the same time. <laughs> Let's talk about it for 30 more seconds and then I'll quilt. The idea with the spineless feather though is that the all over movement is like a giant meander on the quilt top. Basically, you'll see that as I quilt and I kind of alternate sides. The beauty of it being spineless is that you can curve it. So instead of going left, right, left, right, left, right, you might go left, right, left, left, left and the whole thing is going to turn a corner. That's the critical part, and that's what I'm gonna make use of today. So instead of a feather plume shape today, it's going to be a pointy shape, and one of my Instagram viewers um, was the winner in the name sweepstakes. She got a Starbucks coffee out of the deal, and it is called Boomerang, and you'll see why as I start quilting it. And I have a thread break. Okay, let's make a few adjustments here. We're going to try this with lights off as well since I am stopped and I'll try and determine what caused that thread break. And this, by the way, is a good opportunity to mention one of my rules of thumb. My thumbs have quite a few rules. One of them is when you have one thread break or bobbin issue, you know, things happen when you're stitching. So one, I usually just go ahead and start up again at the most convenient place. But if it happens twice, then I say, okay, something's wrong and I'll start digging a little deeper. So for now, I've literally just rethreaded my machine. I'm going to undo a few stitches and start again and we'll see if that fixes it. If it breaks again, then we're going to rethread the whole thing. So let's see if we can figure out what happened. Okay, let's turn the lights off for you guys and see if this is a little clearer. 
Again, give us some feedback on how that looks. Mr. Producer thinks that you'll be able to see the quilter better, quilting better in that way. So I've double checked. My thread is pulling through. It feels right. Feels like I know it should feel like I'm used to it feeling. Remember, know your machine. So that's my first check. It feels like it's pulling through easily and I'm going to pull up my bobbin thread and feel the same thing on that. Does it feel like it ought to? Yes, it does. So I'm going to go ahead and try quilting one more time. So all I've done is gone back over about a quarter inch of my stitching at a corner of one of those feathers and done a few lock stitches. So that's going to be visible, but not very. And I'll pause a moment and snip those feathers or those uh, thread tails really close to. And I'm going to go ahead and put this on um, manual mode. That way you guys don't see those handy dandy little red lights, which are my stitch regulator. And it just makes it a little easier to see. So you can see why it's called boomerang. But it is still the same basic thread path as the all over spineless feather. I'm still moving around the quilt top in the same way and moving around within my design in the same way. So if you have not yet taken that free class, you will definitely want to before you attempt this design. This one is just a little harder, I would say, because they're not rounded ends. So it's a little bit more challenging to fit them in next to each other. So definitely get really comfortable moving around your quilt top with the rounded, softer feather before you try this pointy version. But I quite like this. The feather is, is quite a traditional shape and a very lovely one. I absolutely love feathers. But this is just a little more maybe contemporary look. definitely a less feminine and soft look and I thought it would just be something a wee bit different for this runner or table topper I am using Isocord 100% poly thread on the top and I have a very, very pale yellow, really a cream thread. It's just a shade off of white. That's my top thread and it's a 40 weight. And I have a new favorite bobbin thread um, acquired at the Puyallup Quilt Show last weekend. It is by Wonderfill and it's called Deco Bob. Many of you might be familiar with it. It's not a new brand or anything like that. It's just something I have not used very much. But it is an 80 weight, 100% poly thread. So the beauty of an 80 weight is A, your bobbin holds an awful lot of thread, which is really, really nice to have um, in the bobbin of your long arm. You can quilt for a long, long time before it runs out. And B, because it is so fine, it doesn't, um, it doesn't show as much as a thicker thread does. So you can get away with a bigger color difference. So today's is quite small, but I do have a cream in the bottom today instead of this same pale yellow. I often match my threads top and bottom, but I feel like this might give me the capability of, you know, possibly having a little more light, medium and dark bobbin threads and not having to wind as many different bobbins. So I'm kind of experimenting with that in the upcoming weeks. So for those of you who have quilted the all over feather, are you seeing how this is very, very similar in how I move about the quilt? It's got that same basic meander shape, a large meander. That's what's guiding where I'm traveling. 
and then it has the same, you know, alternating plumes, but not quite alternating, adding extras whenever I need to turn a corner. So left, right, left, right, 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 and then another left. And that's how I go back and forth around the corners. And I really try when I'm doing this to always be doing unequal amounts. As soon as you go left, right, left, right, you get a straight line of feathers. I don't love that look. I want this to always be curving like a meander would, right? There's never a straight line in it. So I try to, at, at the very least, you know, left, left, right, right, so that there's always curvature going on. And you'll find your own amount of that that you want to use as you quilt this design, but I do like mine to always curve. What I have not thought of for this design is what I call kind of an extra little fill that I can um, tuck into corners in my regular feather. That's kind of a, a comma shaped um, feather and it, how do I want to say, I can just stretch it to fit in awkward corners because I'm doing a rounded design on a square quilt, right? I don't really have a different one like that for this design, so I'm just literally elongating or stretching some of them out when I need to fill in an extra little space. So basically they're three-sided and they just, they do indeed feel like a boomerang. All kinds of names were suggested to me for this one, but that one just struck a chord for me. Because you kind of go out the tip and back in, out the tip and back in, out the tip and back in, and it feels boomerang-like. When I get to the edge of the quilt, if there's enough room, I make it curve around. If there's not enough room, I just make it look like it has continued off the edge of the quilt, like this, and continue on with my design. Using that basted edge to travel as needed. I'm basically starting the second pass. This is, this is kind of my own rhythm that I've fallen into with feathers or boomerangs, is that my meander, if I make it too ginormous, it just gets unwieldy. So I end up going, I started at the right hand side of my quilt and I end up going all the way left and all the way right before I have to do an advance on my Q24. If you have a smaller frame, that might be different for you if you're quilting a different size of feather that might be different for you. But that's what works for me, is this kind of two-step, if you will. Always when I'm freehanding, I'm keeping a weather eye on thick seam allowances. Can you see this one here if we got the close-up camera on, Mr. Producer, sir? Right here. So there's, you know, half square triangles. There's quite a few seam allowances intersecting right here. This is fairly bulky. It's not a problem to quilt over, but in my experience, if I quilt around that, 
if I, if I centered a feather over it, that would be the easiest to quilt, but it will make this seam pop up like a button after I release the quilt off the tension of my long arm frame. So I've always got half an eye looking out for thick seam allowances like that, and I'm trying to stitch them down or at least stitch very close to them, and I do that on purpose. That makes the final quilt look so much flatter. Mr. Producer is asking me a question. One moment, please. All right, we're getting lots of questions about not being able to see the pattern. So let's try messing around with the lighting a little bit. I'm gonna turn my machine light on. We're gonna try that for a few minutes. And if that does not work, I'm going to stop for a minute and put a side lamp on so that you all can see it and kind of um, cast a shadow from one side. So let me know how this goes. I'll just do it for a few seconds. And then I'll, um, well, I'll probably do it for 30 seconds anyway while we wait for comments to come in. There's a little bit of delay. But let me know what you think about this one, okay? Lightwise. White can be very, very difficult to get to show up on camera. So we will do our best to make this visible for you. Mr. Producer's bustling around behind me with my floor lamp, so I suspect that he's thinking that's what we've got to do. just keeping on quilting while he gets that set up and then we'll make some adjustments here. There's another thick seam and you saw that I purposely went and quilted right over it. Here's another. And quilting over those seams really makes a difference to the overall flat quality of your finished quilt. Okay, I'm gonna pause right here and we're going to mess with some lighting. Okay, so I am setting up a side lamp. I've got my machine light on, correct? Okay, so I'm gonna turn my machine light off and my side light on and we're just gonna see how this looks. Bear with me, it takes a second to get to all the adjustments here. Um, do 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 do, light bulb off. Okay, is that looking any better at all? We have to keep room lights on or you just get such terrible shadows on camera. If I were filming a little reel or something, I would turn my room lights right off. Let's give that a try, yes? Okay. Does that make any difference? We're still trying, we're still trying some things, you guys. We're turning lights on, off. That's probably a little better. Okay, one more thing to try. How's that looking? So it's not ideal, it's not ideal, but we'll try it for a little bit. Again, you guys give us some feedback and if it looks better for you, I'll continue on this way. Here we go, let's quilt. So again, the feedback has just a little bit of delay, but go ahead and type into the chat box what you're thinking about the visibility of this. I do always try and take some good photographs in good lighting and post them on Instagram and Facebook so that at least you can see some nice close-up looks at the design. I know it's not the same as seeing it stitched out in detail, but I just don't know that we can achieve all the things, but we'll try. We will certainly try. I'm 
while I'm buzzing across this last little bit, I have a funny story for you guys. So the last Live and Unscripted, which was in February of 2023, um, was a Murphy's Day kind of quilting day. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong, it felt like. And one of you viewers, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was, um, mentioned the book Alexander and the very bad, horrible, no good day. I think there's a few more bad adjectives in there. Anyway, so I went and looked up that little book on Amazon and you know how you can kind of uh, preview the first couple of pages. I could see right off the bat that is a book I'm going to love. So I have ordered that book because it keeps perspective on things, doesn't it? Because of course we all from time to time have no good horrible, very bad, terrible days. And we just have to figure out a way. If you see the light moving, it's because I'm actually bumping the lamp off to the side of me here. Sorry about that. I'll stop at the end of this pass and we'll reassess what we're going to do for lighting for the next pass based on your feedback. You see how I'm just tucking them in along the edge there as best they fit. And now we are paused. Come on, needle down. That's what I want. Hang on a second. Needle down. That's what I want. Okay, yard sticks out. So I'm undoing all the apparatus. Mr. Producer is going to show me some of your comments about the lights. And we'll decide what we do for the next pass. Okay, apparently everyone is liking this view. So we'll try and do that. It's, um, I have the lamp quite close to the right-hand edge of the quilt, so I'm apt to keep bumping into it. But I'll shift it a time or two as we go as well. Let me get things advanced, and then I will take some questions while I get set up for the next row. I'm not going to make a huge advance because I do have to do one more. There's no getting around it. Okay. Okay, I can't see the screen. All right. Let me get my coffee. See, this is what we sacrificed is some, you know, overhead lighting on me, but whatever. You guys came here for the quilting anyway, so it's all good. Northern Sioux, only fair. I keep moving my screen to see if that helps. Not much. <laughs> you know, let me know if that is a fix because I could use that one too sometimes. You could perhaps zooming in will help. I don't know. We're happy to mess with the lighting. It's impossible to have all the things. Room well lit, quilting well lit, visible for you. But if you want to focus on the quilting today and don't care if I'm standing in the shadows, fair's fair. Jan, it looks better. Is this design in any of your other videos where it shows up better? I don't think I've done this one in a live and unscripted before, Jan. I've done it for customers and showed photographs before. Don't think I've quilted it live before that I can recall. Joan, will Susan add in one of the Q-tip shapes to take up odd space like she does in the all-over feather? Do you know, I haven't, Joan, because it's curved and I don't think it fits as well. For a fill, what about a long pointed ribbon-esque shape like a blade of grass looking shape? You know, probably could. Probably could do a twist with a ribbon type end too. That's actually a really great idea, Barbara. I might give that one a try, but I probably won't try it on this one because I've already quilted so much of the quilt without it. When I'm going to add a fill, I like to sprinkle it throughout the quilt so it looks intentional and like part of the design. Jennifer, you don't practice force first before you hit your quilt. I usually just something. Um, you know, in some sense I do. So for example, when this was a brand new design, I certainly doodled it, practiced it on my plexiglass sheet, figured it out before I laid it on the quilt top. But when it's a design I've already quilted before and I'm pretty comfortable with it, I don't usually do a practice session before I start. One certainly could, but I don't. This is a reality show. I'm being honest. And I don't see that magnets that you have in your front bar. Can you show us what those look like? Sure can. You're looking straight. Where? Can I get it in front of the yellow so you can see it? There you go. You can see how it's kind of U-shaped the metal and then the back is filled 
with the magnet. These would have come from Harbor Freight, which is a local, very inexpensive hardware store near to me. I do have a link for them on my show notes of past episodes because I know other people have said they can't find them. Most hardware stores will sell them because people use them in their garages and shops and in their kitchen for hanging knives on. They're very inexpensive. They're a couple bucks and they're very, very useful. I love them. Okay, more questions? Sandy, how do you keep that cup from vibrating off the machine? Um, it has a piece of double-sided sticky tape underneath it. It is, it is stuck. The last has helped for me to see the stitches. Okay, the last light change. Good to know. Jackie, how do you adjust a quilt down or around into each fabric patch? In terms of the seams of the quilt, Jackie, if that's what you're asking, I'm not really paying attention to that. This is an all over quilting design, so it is not specific to any seams or shapes. I'm just laying it over the whole quilt top. Only thing I'm paying attention to is some of those bulky seams to get them stitched down. Bobby, sometimes my machine feels heavy when I stitch or feels like it is dragging. Any thoughts on that? I mean, that could be a longer answer, but A, I would check to make sure that your machine is level. And B, I would check that all your wheels, tracks, etc., are clean. A little bit of thread, a little bit of lint will give a surprising amount of drag. So I would clean with a damp cloth or alcohol swabs, anything like that, and make sure everything is sparkling clean. Susan, I love watching you, but really can't see the pattern you're quilting. Uh, could you possibly draw out? I don't really have a, an apparatus for drawing it out today, no. Um, I will post pictures, as I mentioned. I'll post some good, well-lit pictures afterwards and... You know, you can trace over that with your finger if you like. Um, because it doesn't cross over, it's possible to find that continuous line, right? Janice, is there a reason I'm not seeing new episodes of these events on YouTube? Uh, Mr. Producer is just saying hit the subscribe button because it, and, and then when you watch one or two, it's apt to show you more. Um, Stitched by Susan has always been the name of my channel. So you should be able to find all of these videos under my channel name. And one more, Joan, why did Susan pick this design? Oh, great question, Joan. Um, you know, it just feels like I've been doing a lot of curly, swirly stuff lately. And with this kind of folksy background, I did show you the backing a little bit. You can kind of see it up here in the roll. It's a little bit folk arty, right? It's not uber traditional. And I just thought this was a little different. And I like that. And I did put my plexi board um, on top of it last, last night or yesterday whenever I was deciding what design I was going to quilt and tried out a couple of different ones. And, and I was happy with this. So that's what I chose. Okay, let's get advancing. Um, my quilt top is floating, as you see, and I always run along the front of it. Dave, you want a different view here for a sec? I always run along the front of it and grab both quilt top and batting and kind of pinch and pull. This is one of my preventive measures against the thing pulling up, whether it's the quilt top or whether it's the batting underneath. So making sure that they're smoothed down. Taking a look at seam lines. I've got this lovely border seam line right here, right? I've got a good gauge to make sure that is running parallel to my rails. And it is, so we're good to go. I left my needle down, so I'm going to go ahead and baste the right side first this time, because it does not matter at all what order you do it in. And as always, I'm grasping the fabric behind what's already been stitched and just pulling it just a very gentle tug to make sure it pulls under the needle at the pace I want it to and doesn't get pushed out in front of the needle. Quilting is such a cumulative thing. So as the quilter, you know, every little bit of effort that I put into making the quilt square adds up. No one thing is magical, but all the things together add up. And this is one of them. You know, tugging it down flat is one of them. Um, making sure not even an eighth of an inch of fabric pushes out in front of my hopper foot is one of them. Because when you think about it, if I got an eighth of an inch of fullness in this one pass, if I had a big quilt with seven passes, that's an inch and an eighth. That would give me a frowny quilt by the time I got to the bottom. So it's those little cumulative things that help. And in fact, you know, the reverse is true. If the quilt is an eighth of an inch off, if you took up an eighth each pass, right, you could evenly and fairly painlessly square up a quilt in the process of traveling from top to bottom. Hope all that math made sense. 
Mr. Producer is telling me, check my math, and he's right. It's seven-eighths and not one, not an inch and an eighth. But, you know, in fairness, I am multitasking here. But Dave is getting a very good chuckle at my expense. So I'm putting the side clamps on. And I am going to put my fancy side light on. And really, all this side light is is a floor lamp and this this is my go-to when i'm quilting a quilt that has you know perhaps a print that's really difficult to see or even black i will literally turn out every light in my room including my machine light even in the evening and just shine this low and sharp from one side and basically quilt by shadow it is my most desperate measure when i can't see what i'm quilting whether I can make it do the same thing for you on camera because I cannot turn out all the room lights. I don't know, but I'll try. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the lamp on this side. Let's see, what happens if I turn out this room light, Dave? Whoa, you, you guys will be able to see the quilting. Let's try this out. Alex, this is our son, by the way. Producer is not invited to breakfast, which is a little side note because after this episode is finished, my son is taking me out for brunch. Isn't that lovely? Okay, you guys, give me some feedback on this one. I'm, I, as you saw, I have all the room lights out overhead now. There's still daylight coming in, but let me know if you can see the stitching on this. I'll bet you can. Let me just get things in place here and get the right stitches on. I've anchored my thread. I'm in manual mode. Um, I'm going to hit the lamp is the only problem. I've got to move it just a little. Okay, let's see how this goes. Here we go. One second. I'm moving my yardstick in a bit because I felt a little bump against the side clamp. We don't want that to happen. As always, let us know in the comments, how's this working for you in terms of light? And I'll shift the lamp closer to me from time to time, because it's probably best when it's right at my elbow. There's a seam again that I purposely got right up close to. And again. I mentioned earlier that our new friend Jeremy Dickerson also has a YouTube channel on which he streams quilting as well. So hopefully Mr. Producer has gotten a moment to put that link in the chat for you. I encourage you to check out Jeremy's channel as well. Another one that I ought to mention today actually, I was talking about my podcast earlier, Measure Twice, Cut Once, um, and how it is often conversations with other quilters. 
So a recent episode, I believe it was two weeks ago, was with um, Adria Good, and she is also called the Quilting Coach Chick. So she too has a great YouTube channel. Um, she does a lot more custom quilting than I do, and many of her episodes are just music while she's quilting, but it's a great opportunity for you to see things being done also in real time. So she's just got the camera watch the quilt take shape as she's quilting. So I recommend you check out her channel too. Tell her I sent you. And the podcast episode was, you know, a conversation with her and particularly we talked about the building of her business because it was not what she began you know, with the intention of doing, but it grew. And so her story is quite amazing because it did not all come easily for her. She seems like a quite quiet person, maybe introspective. So I suspect going on camera was not easy for her. I don't think she's a talker quite like me. So, <laughs> but it's still very inspiring then to hear her talk about, you know, the new things that she needed to learn how to do, the new skills, the video editing, these sorts of things. And to see that you don't have to be a guru to do this sort of thing. You just have to find out the information you need to know and learn how to do it and on you go. Or you get you a husband like Mr. Producer here who already knows these things. But I'm not sharing, just saying. Maybe I'm going too far. That's not what you came to this channel to hear about, is it? Um, again, oh, I got to put a side note in there because I know you sharp-eyed people will see that I actually got a three-pointed little boomerang there. And you notice I did not stop to undo. In the scheme of things, it's going to read as exactly the same texture as all of what I'm quilting. So it is staying in there. I was starting to say I'm getting to the edge of my quilt and I'm not going to turn the corner because I just have one more advance to do and I'm going to head, go ahead and do that and baste across the bottom edge though earlier I did do two kind of passes of the feather this time I just did one I'm going to go ahead and baste the bottom edge and get that all secure and then come back I forgot to move the lamp for you guys sorry about that So you're seeing the downside now of having uh, my lighting turned off. I'm doing a show in the dark. It really helps to take these clamps off before you roll too. You're getting to see the dim, the studio in the dim. I will take questions now. I will turn some lights back on. We'll do a couple questions. Then we'll go back to quilting. Oh, that's what I was doing. Aha. Okay. Miriam, how where do you put a magnet on the machine for scissors without harming the mechanisms in the motor? Do I need to talk with a specialist? That's a great question, Miriam, because you've probably seen I keep picking up my clips and leaving them lay around my thread snips. Um, and I've got actually some magnets on order and they're just small round sort of button style and I'm going to affix it with adhesive tape. It comes on the back of those magnets and I'm just gonna stick it where it's most natural for me to grab my scissors. It's probably gonna be on the side of my machine head. So it's not absolutely permanent. I can move it if I need to. I don't think there's any chance it'll hurt the mechanism. I just want them to be where I can grab them without having to turn them around in my hand, right? That's why I don't like, you know, the retractable snips or whatever that dangle because they're never right when I go to grab them. Does that make sense? My opinion. And the answer is no, it won't hurt the machine. It's on, it's on the exterior. You could do it on a handlebar too if that was more convenient. Cindy, not really a question, but I see it's okay to make some feathers larger to fit, right? Oh, you better believe it is. Yeah. There's all, you know, there's a, there's a general range of sizes, but it's all sizes in there. Jen, do you add several of those points when turning like you did with the spineless feathers? Well, each 
blade. These are almost more blades than feathers. Each of them is three, has two points and then a swing back, except for the one that I inadvertently put three on. So I don't add more points when I'm turning. I just add more blades because it forces the feather to turn. Does that make sense? So I, I've, I've quilted one blade and then I'll put three or four on the other side before I do another one on the right, if that all makes sense for you. Watch the feathers class, really, that will come pretty clear. Cindy, are you traveling across instead of your usual triangular way? That's correct, Cindy. So basically, I mentioned early on, basically my movement is a giant meander across and back, yes. The same purpose is accomplished. I'm not getting any unquilted areas that I can't reach out in front of me, right? Northern Sioux, a three-pointed feather, you renegade. I know, right? Laurie, Stitched by Susan After Dark. Good one. That might be our new title. We could have a whole series with the side lamp on. Jan, was Dave a producer before? He's not. He's a hobbyist. He just loves this. He just loves this stuff. So, okay. Let us finish basting. Oh, apparently there's one more question. Barbara, say again the brand for the side clamps. Red Snapper. So the same as the red rods that I use to load the quilt, it's the same brand. The loading rods come as a set, the Red Snapper loading system, but Red Snapper also makes side clamps. Um, do I have a link for that in my show notes? I think I do. I have a link for the Red Snappers and that will take you to the website. The side clamps are there as well. No, I do. In all the past episodes, it's, it's on there. Oh! Look at you guys, busy talking and I'm still in manual mode. Now I'm in basting. Again, I'm stitching by guess and by gosh and letting Stella stitch her straight line down the vertical side. And I'm putting the channel lock on for the bottom edge so that I'm sure to get a nice straight edge. That matters to me. touch. Oh, I can't seem to move it just a hair. Close enough. No, I've got to move it just a hair more. I'm hardly catching the fabric. There we go. All I want is for this basting stitch to be within a quarter inch, right? I don't want the quilt maker to have to undo it. I want it to get taken up in the binding of the quilt. I usually aim for about an eighth. And if you're not comfortable with your fingers as close to the needle as, as I'm doing, by all means, take a minute and drop a few pins in this first. Again, you want to be sure that the fabric is not pushing out in front of you toward the right. So if you don't feel that you can do that by eyeballing it, drop a few pins in there so that you know. It's way faster to put a few pins in than to have to undo it. Believe me, I've tried that. So I'm just trotting around the machine now to undo my channel lock lever it's kind of underneath so when i've sewed across under the quilt i can't reach it from the front side i'm going to baste up this side and then we'll take a few more comments and i'll wet my whistle a little bit but let's just get everything secure so we're ready to quilt so I don't need the magnets on the front anymore because this is basted, right? But I will still put my grippers on the side. Occasionally when I have a small quilt like this, I, I feel more confident. I've had good success with not necessarily using these side clamps because it is small. There's not as many places to go wrong. I can be confident my backing is smooth and stays smooth. So, you know, you find your own level but it does only take 30 seconds to put them on, you know? And then you just, one more preventive measure. So there they are, on. Okay, my whistle wetter. Let's have some comments. Comments, comments. <laughs> Jennifer, when you take out your bobbin and when it's empty, do you put just a little oil in the bobbin case? Well, I, I do usually oil my machine when I change bobbins. In the case of my Bernina, it's not in the case. It's part of the bobbin apparatus. But yes, I typically put a tiny drop in whenever I change a bobbin, or at least with every two bobbins. 
Bobby, do you make every attempt to complete a quilt once you start it? No stopping to maintain tension and pattern. Definitely not true. I mean, sometimes I stop just for lunch or stop overnight, whatever the case may be. Um, tension is a bigger one because I get asked that a lot. Don't you check the tension every bobbin change, don't you? And the answer is no, I generally don't, but I'm really aware. The sound of my machine, what the stitch should look like. You've seen my quick check underneath with my fingernail along the thread on the bottom to make sure there's no eyelashing. So a lot of those things I just kind of do mechanically as I'm going, but I'm pretty confident. Like I haven't changed bobbin during this quilt either, right? So as long as I checked it at the beginning and things were good and I was quilting earlier this morning, right? With exactly the same thread combination, same bobbin even. So then I just proceed until I see signs of trouble. Does that all make sense? Hope so. Sandy, are you worried at all about the thread tension now using an 80 weight on the bobbin? That's a great question, Sandy. I did, I actually lowered my top tension just a hair when I put the 80 weight in. So I'm not worried about it because my machine is very good at, at um, compensating. So I fine tuned that when I put the 80 weight bobbin thread in and now it's maintaining pretty steadily. Like I'm doing quilts that are of similar thickness. I've been using the same batting. All those can be factors. Still, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just check it at the beginning of a quilt if I was changing some of those factors and perhaps make an adjustment in the tension. I have trouble putting on the snapper side clamps. Any tips? I do have one tip for you and I'll go ahead and show you that one because it's a small quilt today and we have a little time. Can we show this side camera again, Mr. Producer? And I'll show you the one because I've had the same trouble. So it comes, the trouble it seems like comes in two ways. Either one, you've got kind of a roughly or loose edge here and it's hard to fit in. Or if it's a fraying or selvage edge, it can be really difficult to get it in this super narrow channel. My favorite secret weapon is one of my corsage pins. Any pin will do. And I get it started and then I can run the pin along that fabric, feeding it in there just a little bit more easily. So I don't know if you can see on camera, this edge is cut and it's not perfectly straight, but even with that little bit of unevenness, I'm able to feed it in with the pin. And then here's one other one. This quilt is nice and, and taut here, but sometimes if you've got a longer quilt and there's some excess fabric here without any batting, it sags a little bit. And you can fix that by tugging on the last layer that's at the top here, swooping it around and tucking it snugly under your roller. I can't really show you because I don't have any ex excess here. But a couple, three weeks ago on Instagram, I showed a little tiny video of that. But you can just tuck that extra pleat right under the take up bar and it will keep this nice and taut again. And you might have to do that several times in a big quilt. So those all help. But the pin is super, super useful. Get it started and then use that pin to just feed it in there. And there you go. So hopefully that helped. Let's get quilting, okay. Oh, we still have comments yet, oh my gosh, okay. Christine, how did you move the smidge if you still had the channel locks on? Good question, Christine. The channel locks are, um, they reduce the movement of the machine, but it is not an absolute unbreakable pause, right? So I can shift it. It just takes a little bit of tension. So I just moved it a smidge. Easily done. But thanks for noticing that and sharp eyes. I know you guys have sharp eyes. Jane, you may have said this before, but is your studio in a large room in your house or a basement? Both. So it is a uh, outdoor entrance basement family room and it's about 21 feet by 16. It's not huge. Crystal, how many bobbins do you keep pre-wound ahead of time? Usually not a ton, Crystal. How many bobbins do you have wound before each project? Um, I usually do it by project because typically my way has been to match or very closely match um, the top and bottom threads. So, you know, I was talking earlier now that I am experimenting with Deco Bob and I might use my cream colored bobbins for more projects for pale gray or pale green or pale pink, right? I may load more, but in general. I estimate how many bobbins I think it will take for a quilt. And you, you get to know that pretty quickly when you do a lot of quilts. And then I just go ahead and pre-wind what I think I'll need for that quilt. Especially if I only have one spool of that thread, I'll make sure I have enough pre-wound. 
A baby quilt you can usually do in one. A lap quilt will usually take two. It depends on the density, but you know, you'll get used to that ballpark and I do try and load enough for the whole project. Jennifer, I know this is a crazy question. Uh, if you have other bobbins that are saying, wait, can you use it? I'm not following. I use glide thread, but I have bobbins that are omni thread and 30 weight. I don't think there's any hard and fast rule that says you can't. I feel like 30 weight is a very heavy thread to be using in a bobbin. I'm not sure why you would want to use heavier underneath. I would be inclined to always go the same or lighter underneath. For reasons of economy in the bobbin, you get more yards on a, on a bobbin. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not an expert on thread tension because I don't use tons of them. So your best bet might be to go to places like Superior Threads website. They have lots of instructional information about threads and their combinations and tensions. So maybe check that out. Judy, what is your schedule for live and unscripted? Generally, Judy, I air the first and third Friday of each month at 9 a.m. Pacific. But this year I'm traveling somewhat for Bernina, so that is varying. Today, for example, is the second, right, Friday of March, and I'll be on again next week, the third Friday of March. So I try and do it twice at least in each month. Hope that helps. And I try and let you know in my newsletter ahead of time too when they're coming. Leanna, can you show us where you attach the channel lock on your machine? Um... I don't know that I have, do we have a camera view that will show it today? Okay. Hang on, we're trying. But I've got the machine at the other end. Let's see. Can we just tip it though? Because this is what I need to show or that one. Hang on a sec, we're getting it set up for you. We aimed please. So because my machine is set up for robotics, my channel locks involve the belts that drive the machine. So if I did not have robotics, they would more likely be magnetic or rubberized little stoppers. But in my case, mine are gripping. Sorry, are we able to see yet? Yeah. There we go. Mine are able to grip these belts. There's two little pegs that feed into the gears and grip those belts. And that is my channel locks on the robotic system. Like I said, if I did not have the robotics, it would be a rubber stopper that clamped down on either my X or my Y axis. Um, and some brands, they're magnetic. Maybe there are other types that I know not of. And Carol, do you ever use pre-wound bobbins? I have not, Carol. Again, because my method has been to use matching thread that was not conducive and so I've always wound my own and honestly it does not take very long I think I'll probably keep on winding my own but you could use pre-wound certainly um, long arm machines will handle them beautifully and certainly they're a nice convenience okay got my yardsticks in place more questions or is that it that's it okay we're on to quilting let's see where did I end I ended on the left side over here. I'm just looking at my right side, engaging with my long arm. I feel like I'm gonna have to back it up just a little bit. Yep, I am, about a half an inch. Let me just double check and make sure now that I can reach everywhere I need to go. Boy, that's a close thing. Hang on a second, you guys. Okay, I'm gonna have to do this twice. Yep, I have to. It's I'm just cutting it too, too, too close to hitting the back rail or the front rail. So I'm just going to back up about two inches so I know I have space. And then I'll do one more small advance. Someone is asking what this pattern is called. It is called Boomerang. So far it has not been released in any classes, but it is slated to come out in my advanced membership at some point later this year. Uh, let me just look here. I'm just looking back at where I stopped because I was kind of in the middle of a feather. I see where I was. Okay, I got it. I'm up to speed now. Usually I drop my blue seam ripper whenever I have a thread break or a new bobbin so that I can see where I was at a moment's notice. Um, let's lock stitch like so and let's get in manual mode okay I will move the lamp oh I can't that's the end of the wire 
That's it. It's fine. All right. Here we go. I mean, it's kind of fun that we figured out a different lighting option. Because now we know for the future, when we have a design that's difficult to see, that this combination works fairly well. made a wide pass there with my, with my feathers when I was joining up. But the truth of the matter is it doesn't really matter in what order I move around the quilt top. It's still going to look like that basic giant meander shape. So I won't go down as low now as I did with that last swoop of feathers. But I'm also kind of looking ahead at the edge of my quilt thinking I can probably do this in two more sweeps across the quilt rather than three. So I'm just going to do a more curvaceous and broader meander. I had said I was going to talk a few moments about the quilt that is behind me too. Um, that is my own design and it was originally released as a block of the month and its name is Starstruck. And the reason for making it kind of a block of the month was it's constructed in rows and each row of stars kind of highlights a different skill. So one of them is tiny piecing, one of them is using the Trirex ruler, things like that. So when I was designing my pattern, I made three different versions of this quilt. One was uh, a navy blue background with very country florals. One was kind of a pale robin's egg blue with a more whimsical floral. And then this one that you see behind me here, which I call golden starstruck, um, with the very bold, um, the color of solid is called yarrow. I absolutely adore it. And I planned it to be a statement because I wanted to do this custom quilting on it that you can kind of see. Well, as I was piecing it and constructing the different rows, um, I used all Allison glass prints and the top row of stars, which I do not think actually you can see on the camera today, I did not care for the coloring. So I had all the rows made and I went to assemble it and it just was not the right set of colors. So I took that one strip out, so it's the full width of the quilt, and guess what I have now? I have a table runner, and that's been hanging in my studio for, oh, a couple years. <laughs> we won't say how many. And anyway, I thought that would be a fun, live and unscripted project to do a little bit of custom quilting and ruler work. So that is what I have slotted for next Friday. Pausing for a second to shift my light. My elbow is starting to bump it. Yeah, so instead of an edge to edge design like this one, we're gonna do some ruler work and it will still hopefully not be too terribly long of an episode because it is a small runner. So things like uh, basting it, all the sort of usuals, and then there'll be some stitching in the ditch 
uh, some geometric designs with the ruler, and then some background fills around it. So that's what's coming up next Friday, which I believe is the 17th of March. Also at 9 a.m. Pacific time. I believe Facebook does this, but I know that YouTube does. It converts the time for a scheduled live event into your own time zone. So if you go to my channel and view that upcoming event, it will tell you how many days and hours it is away based on your time zone. So you don't have to do conversions, but you can also click the little bell and you will get a notification when I go live. So I encourage you to do that. Like and subscribe. There's plenty of time to share that episode with your friends. If you think some of them might be interested in custom quilting too. And details on it and a picture of the table runner were also in yesterday's newsletter that went out. So I'm just advancing those last couple of inches. So I definitely do appreciate when you take a moment to click the thumbs up button. It really, really helps youtube to know to share my video with other free motion quilters and um, helps it to get seen and kind of funny story i was talking earlier about um, the last episode which was a bit like alexander's no good horrible terrible dreadful day and you know so many things went wrong and so many of you viewers were incredibly gracious and either typed in the chat during the airing or later on or emailed me you know how relatable that was and how comforting it was in a way to see that this sort of stuff happens to other people and specifically that this happens to long armors and one lady said it well she said you know it was interesting to see that long arm quilting part of the job description is troubleshooting and she's exactly right part of the description is figuring out tension issues or figuring out loading issues. And if you know that's part of the job description, it's not nearly as frustrating when it happens. But what was very fascinating about all of that, you know, from my point of view, it was kind of an embarrassing, honestly, episode because everything was going wrong, right? And for about a second after we were done, I said to Dave, you know, maybe we should just scrub that episode right off the internet. We might break it, you know? Maybe we should just get rid of it. And then these comments start coming in, right? So I decided, no, I just need to, you know, own it. That is reality and get on with life. And that has been by far my most viewed episode ever. And that was just three weeks ago. So I found that to be kind of telling that clearly many, many quilters just really related to that incredibly raw <laughs> session of quilting. So you're welcome. <laughs> Let's hope for my state of mind that it doesn't happen too often. Today has gone much better, hasn't it? In case you haven't seen that episode and want to look for it to see what all the buzz is about, it's called Making Waves. And it was in February of 2023. here as I come to the bottom edge I'm just messing around with it to try and um, fit my feathers in in some ways these points when you come to the perimeter like this are easier than the rounded feathers just because they have points you can stretch the point out like that to fill awkward corners So this quilting design as a whole is called Boomerang 
and that name is courtesy of one of my Instagram followers. The first time I put this on a quilt, I put some pictures out there and, and asked for name suggestions, and I got all kinds, many great ones, but I liked the boomerang, the swinging out and swinging back in. And if you have not already um, caught my free all over feather class, I encourage you to do that. That is definitely the foundation for this quilting design. The movement around the quilt is exactly the same idea. Did you see that? I got a very wonky feather there. And once again, I'm not undoing it. It will not catch the eye because the spacing is similar. Um, there's no unusual angle in it or crossing over of quilting, which I don't have anywhere else. So I feel like no one will ever see it. And I know you guys will never tell. Approaching the end here, so one more moment to type in your questions if you have them. We'll take a few minutes to answer those. Like and subscribe if you're enjoying this uh, real-time look at free motion quilting. Like and subscribe. Uh, share this episode or any others with your friends that you think might be interested as well. I would really appreciate that. And here we are at the end, a few anchoring stitches and we are finished. So let me turn up the lights, find my snips, which I left laying somewhere. Can't wait for my magnet to come. Okay, there's one light. These overhead lights, by the way, you guys might like to know this. Dave just installed them for me and they are, am I telling this right, sir? They are shop lights from Costco. Inexpensive, incredibly bright, and a very, uh, a very nice white light. I really like the quality of light that they throw. And we just put two of them nose to tail over the long arm and that's what we're using. Okay. Last pass, yes. So you can see now the yarrow colored quilt behind me. So yeah, that gives you an idea of what we'll be quilting next Friday. Joan, Dave, will you tell Dan how much I love his style of playing in Choice of Hymns? If he ever sells commercially, I'll buy some. Absolutely, Joan, we'll, we'll pass that on to him. We just had coffee with him a week or two ago, so yeah. Nadine, I have a Q16 sit down. Will the advanced class still benefit me? You know, Nadine, there are a number of people in it who use sit-down machines, and I believe that yes, it will. A number of the designs in it are um, smaller, like single motifs, like there's a pine cone, for example, a bumblebee that you can drop in among things. But even for designs like this one, useful to you, you just might need to scale them down a smidge because you can't do, you know, big sweeping motions at your sit-down machine, so they might end up being a little smaller, but still should be very helpful to you. Jane, so impressive that you can talk and stitch at the same time. Thanks for sharing. Much, much practice, Jane. But there are days, I'm sure you notice it, I sometimes trip over my words or use the wrong one, and it's just trying to keep those two tracks going side by side. Cheryl, tried to contribute to your Buy Me a Coffee and had trouble. Can you share what that correct address is? Sure, Dave's put it on the screen there. Buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And you know, honestly, many of you are members in my monthly membership too, and I don't mean to, to try and... Um, glean from you in multiple sources. I just know there are people out there who don't necessarily want the monthly subscription or to purchase my large class. But if you wanted a way to contribute something just the one time, it's an easy way to do it. So, and of course, you know that I love my coffee. <laughs> Patty, do you ever bind on the machine? Patty, I have attached binding like to the top side on the machine. It actually works fairly slick just for myself. I've worked it out at my sewing machine. I have, you know, my, my, foot width and all that stuff so precise and where all my quilt lays and everything it's faster for me to do it there it works really well on the long arm too and I think if a person did that frequently you could get very fast at that too it works 
slick. All you need is a straight edge ruler. It's the only special tool you need. Pam, do you sell the starstruck quilt pattern? Great question, Pam. I have not since it was a block of the month, but we're gonna try to have it available by next Friday in a, in a one piece booklet. We're gonna try. I'll need lots of coffee. Just saying. Barbara, could you provide link to Instagram showing tucking and tucking sag on sides onto take up rail? What's the easiest way to do that? Barbara, here's what I'll try to do. I'll have to go look it up, right? And get that link from Instagram. So later today, I will go and find that and I will tuck that link into the show notes. How's that? So check back in four or five hours and I'll try and have it there for you, okay? Ah, okay. So Mr. Producer's letting me know that these comments are in regards to the last wonky episode. Amy, that episode was the most relatable ever and your grace in handling each of the mishaps. I may have thrown something. I may have shed a tear or two, Amy, after it was over. <laughs> I may have done that. Yep, yep, it was a day. Some days just go that way. We all have those days. Most of ours aren't broadcast to the world though. And you know, that was the thing of it, Lori. And that was kind of why for a minute I wanted to just scrub it because I thought, do I really have to show everybody all of that? Um, hence the book about Alexander and the very bad, horrible, terrible day. Because I think I'll really relate to that book. Angie, it's been a bit of a horrible, terrible, yeah, week for me as I've had to spend the last four evenings ripping up stitching for three whole rows on a client quilt. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I relate to that. I know how hard that is. A little side note. Coming up, I believe it's scheduled for April. One of the advanced membership lessons is on unpicking. And I'm trying to share all the time savers that I've found to make that as painless as possible. It's not pain free, but reduced pain. Tammy, seeing you deal with those struggles helped me know that it's just part of the process, not me being a beginner. Yes, it is part of the process. It is. Jennifer, did you... I did your binding the way you did it on the diagonal. Did it work? Thank you, my quilt for the first time. Looks great. The Oh, 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 the binding on the diagonal. Now I'm catching up. Good, good. Yes, that's a great tip for having a nice smooth and flat binding. Good, I'm glad it worked for you. Cheryl, I didn't see it, but I'll go back and watch it. It's encouraging to us newbies that you struggle once in a while also. It helps us to keep trying. It absolutely does. And you, you probably get this feeling already. I'm a teacher at heart. I like showing what I've figured out. So when I've figured out how to use those side clamps and figured out a way to make it go smoother, I like to share that. Um, it, it takes time to pull it together, time to, you know, create the video and edit it and, and all the things. But as much as I can, I try to share those little moments. I know, I know how, how tough they can be. Okay, that's it for comments. You guys, I think that's the end of this one. So a super, super duper quick, recap this has been free motion all over quilting a variation of my all over feather design showing the basting etc and my boomerang pattern i will be live again next week march 17 friday morning at 9 a.m and this time it's going to be custom quilting and a little bit of ruler work on a long table runner similar in style and color to the one that you're seeing behind me on the wall so tune in for that. I would appreciate if you would give the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And also if you click the little notification bell after you've subscribed, YouTube will then graciously tell you whenever I'm going live. And yeah, that's that. So until next time, I am Susan Smith. Enjoy whatever you're doing today and I'll see you next time.